Turn with me this morning, please, to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. The psalm begins with a, a declaration of the psalmist's great sorrows and distresses, afflicted and assaulted. His enemies have come up against him. Wicked men he uses the language of eating up his flesh. There's a, a devouring intensity. He calls upon God for mercy and salvation with confidence and then says from verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray once more. Eternal God, hear us as we come to you, just as your servant David did, to call upon your name and to hear our voice when we cry to you. Father, your ear has not been stopped up since David called. Your heart has not grown cold. Your hand has not grown weary. You are still the same God, yesterday, today and forever. And with confidence in you, we come and ask that you would encourage and instruct our hearts this morning to the praise of the glory of your grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 13 of this psalm is not quite what it may appear to be in our translation. Some of you will have uh, Bibles where words that are added to make sense are in italics. That's the case in this verse in most translations. It starts, I would have lost heart. But those words aren't there. They're supplied to help give meaning. The sentence itself comes as a kind of a broken declaration from a troubled soul. So we should or could read it this way. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And there's a space. There's a pause, a pregnant pause. Imagine somebody who, who, who broke down in their car in the middle of a storm on a, a very dangerous road, very late at night. And they're telling you about their experience, how uh, somebody drove up in, in a vehicle that happened to be, a, it happened to be an AA man. You know, other services are available, I know that. But, but just at that moment, the AA drove past and they're telling you their story. And they said it was, it was such a terrible night. The, the hail and the storm were pounding down. I was miles from anywhere. The road was beginning to, to flood. I was out on my own. There was no one around. And unless that repair vehicle had driven past at just that moment, you fill in the gap. You know where they're going with that. Can you imagine what it would have been like if I hadn't received that kind of help at that very moment. And that's what David is doing to us in this psalm. Unless the Lord, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, 
What David is doing here is he's leading us to the edge of a dangerous precipice and he's making us look over the edge. Some of us do better with that than others. You may be one of those, you only need to look over the edge or you see one of those videos of people who've climbed onto the top of a building or a mast or something and it's not even real but you still get the camera zooming down and you feel queasy and distressed and everything tightens up and you think, I just can't handle this. David says, come to the precipice with me. Come to the edge and look over and see the dark depths below. Imagine what it would be like, says David, to live life without God. Imagine what it would have been like for me if I had no God upon whom I could call, if I had no helper to whom I could turn, if I had no favour upon which I could rely, if this distress through which I have passed was without any relief and without any hope. And of course David doesn't leave us there, but in order that we might understand how God dealt with him, he wants us to look over the edge and to see what life could be like if God were not our very present help and aid in time of trouble. And so the first thing here is fainting. And that's what our translators have tried to supply with this phrase, I would have lost heart. Some older versions, I would have fainted. Now, we're trying to give the sense, what would it be like if you didn't believe that you would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? How would you cope? What would be your state if there were no assistance from God, if there were no one in whom you could trust? What if you lived with a permanent sense of helplessness and hopelessness? David is reminding us that by nature we are troubled creatures. We are weak, aren't you? Sick? How many of us have afflictions in our bodies that we're bearing with? We're ignorant. We don't know what a day will bring forth. We have no notion of what will come before the end of this day, let alone the end of the coming week. We're talking about uh, responsibility in the adult Bible class. We're talking about resilience. We're talking about planning and, and what it is to live as a child of God in a responsible way in this world. And it's right that we should do so. But I can show you my calendar with all this nice little colour coding, all planned out, thicker this week and next week and the week after that. Nice empty space, honestly, where I'm meant to be going on holiday. And then the deacons are looking at me and saying, is that true? Yes, it is. And, and then, you know, things further out as the months go, it all looks beautiful. I've got it all planned. It all holds together. It could be turned upside down in a moment. I might not even get to tomorrow's appointments, let alone be able to fulfill them. We plan, but we're so frail. We're so weak. We're so ignorant. We're so easily confused. How many of you face decisions and you do not know whether to turn this way or that way? Sometimes you're not even sure what is right and what is wrong. Other times it's what is best and what is not so good. What is it that we should do? Some of us struggle financially. There's poverty in this world. The squeeze is on. You're not quite sure where perhaps the next grocery shop is going to come from. You're concerned perhaps about what's going to happen with regard to the mortgage payments when the banks start filtering through some of these interest rate rises. You're grieving, grieving for yourself, grieving for others. Loss, fear. We're troubled creatures and we're tempted sinners. We're assaulted by the evil one. We have an adversary who goes about seeking whom he may devour. We're surrounded by seductions, by sights and, and sounds and scents even that draw our hearts away from holiness. We can barely walk down the street, barely go into a shop, barely look at a screen without something that is drawing us into some pattern of sin. Our confidence is undermined. Our habits are shaken. Our souls are pressured. We feel the kind of worldly temptations to go with the flow, to think like the world thinks, to act like the world acts. 
We're so prone to tread water as believers. Drifting. Doubting. Sometimes that sudden satanic assault that comes upon you. Is any of this even true? Or sometimes that ground down confidence because of some distress over time. And you begin wondering, will God perhaps now leave me or forsake me? And we're tried, we're tested servants. When we seek to serve God in the world, we're insulted and we are assaulted. People do not think highly in these days of Christians. Maybe personally, they might have some respect for your integrity, but, but they know that you believe nonsense and they can make that quite clear. And perhaps when you're seeking to stand up for something and you're in a room full of people, all of whom are going in the other direction, whether it's uh, something at work or something in a, in a social environment, and you're meant to be laughing at that joke or you're meant to be indulging in this sin or you're meant to be fiddling that part of your responsibilities, you're meant to be, you know, it's, uh, maybe it's the exam paper and somebody thinks they've got all the answers and they've passed them round beforehand. Or maybe it's because you're in a work environment where, well, we didn't do that properly, so we need to backdate all our checks. And you're up for that, aren't you? You're going to sign the piece of paper to say we did this three months ago when we actually did it three days ago after that accident happened, after that problem arose, after that scam was discovered. You know what it is to be despised? Perhaps even persecuted? Maybe at home? Maybe at work? Every effort you make, the, the extra yards you put in. You say, if I'm going out and knocking on the doors, I'm just exposing myself to further ridicule and disdain. Weary of having the door slammed in my face. Weary of having people sneer and dismiss. In the church, we can end up isolated. Satan comes in and drives wedges between us. Things that are of no account are made to be great matters and become issues over which we contend. The strongest of God's people faint and fail, especially when God seems distant and when we lose sight of him. And that's where David was. He's saying, imagine, imagine what it would be like to be a troubled creature, an attempted sinner, and a tried servant, if there were nothing of God's goodness to look forward to. If there were nothing to hope in, no one to trust in, no one to whom I could turn. Brothers and sisters, the nature of our trials, the number of our troubles, the duration of our afflictions, these things can drag down our souls. And we can begin to wonder or to feel that God is very distant, that the things upon which we've relied are crumbling, that the foundations are breaking apart. It may be that you've never been quite in that position, or it may be that you feel that this is a painfully familiar place to be. Standing on the edge of the precipice, fearing that you might fall into the gloom and darkness below and land on the piercing rocks. If you've not been there yourself, can you at least imagine what it's like? I'm not trying to, to tempt you into it, but what would your life be like, Christian man, woman, boy, girl, if God were not there and God were not good? Can you feel it? Have you felt it? Can you enter into it on behalf of somebody else who's suffering, struggling and distressed? David felt that there were people who wanted to rip him to pieces and feed on his flesh. David had enemies and foes who came up, an army encamping against him. All around him there seemed to be distress and affliction. He was crying out to God. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. This is fainting. This is gloom. This is misery. This is grief. And it is easy, easy for us in this world to start sliding down that path toward that fearful cliff. 
But then there is faith. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living, where would I be? Unless I had believed, unless I had faith, unless I had confidence, unless I trusted in the Lord God. You see, this is the antidote. This is that which overcomes the world, even our faith. And the problem and the challenge can be for us that we live in a world in which there are so many professed alternatives to that of trusting in God. And you may have tried this even if you're not a believer. You may have thought that you can get through this world by yourself. You might have imagined that you can somehow sustain your own existence and yet you seem perpetually to be on the brink of that cliff, peering down into the gloom and the misery below. Some people just deny it. It's, it's, it, literally, there are people who will pretend that things are better than they are. They will lie to themselves, even if they can't lie to other people. People who are going, you, you know that, that technique where you look into a mirror and you tell yourself every morning, every day, and in every way, I'm getting better and better? So that's a lie. You know, even as a Christian, you, know, you can see decay. You can see weakness. It is simply not the case. And for some people who are, who are struggling, I, I don't believe that the world is the way it is. I don't believe that I'm suffering. I just, I'm confident that it will change. People who train themselves to dream in the hope that somehow the dream will become a reality. Some people say, I'll just try and balance things out. I know everything is going badly, but surely a few good things will come along in the end. And they're teetering on the brink and hoping that sooner or later they'll turn the corner. Every cloud has a silver lining. For some, it's drunkenness. Or drugs, street drugs. Or even the drugs you can get from a doctor. Now, some of those drugs have value. There's medical assistance that can be given, but so often the drugs that are taken, whether they're self-medicated or taken from... It is simply a way of masking the symptoms. There's no real cure. For some, it's panic. Just terror, blind terror. People who literally will not and cannot get out of bed because they're afraid of what the day holds. I spoke to somebody recently in another environment. They said they were terrified of going to bed at night because they knew they'd have to get up tomorrow. Despair. Just giving up. Rolling into a ball. Aggression. I'll make this right. I'll trample on others. I'll set myself up. Pride and arrogance. Let's not imagine that all of these are ways of sorting things out out there. It can creep into the church of Jesus Christ. There are Christians who found themselves having a glass of wine and then a bottle of wine and then a couple of bottles just to help them get through the next few days. There are Christians who have begun to deny the reality of their circumstances, telling themselves lies. There are believers who've hidden themselves away from their brothers and sisters. They've learned to create the mask of competence and happiness, while inside their soul is crushed and distressed. What is the remedy? Unless I had believed. My friends, it is faith that helps us in the face of our deepest distresses, the most seemingly hopeless and the most really helpless of circumstances. In our griefs and our sorrows, in our pains and our confusions, as creatures and as sinners and as servants of God, faith and faith only will help. Faith says, God is there. That's its first conviction. And faith knows that God is good. Now let me ask you, are you living a life where you're trying to fill the hole that only God can fill? 
You may be younger, you may be older. Are you perhaps here this morning and you are, you're not a Christian? You're a bit religious, maybe, but you're not trusting in God. What are you doing when the darkness gathers? What are you doing when the troubles come? How are you responding when your flesh and your heart fail? What remedies are you concocting? What assistance are you looking for? How will you sustain your body? How will you save your soul? How will you press forward? Are you desperately trying to do it? Are you trying to cover over the pain and the grief and the emptiness? Are you giving up and just hoping that the world will go away? Is it tucking your head under the bed sheets? You're putting on your makeup every morning. I'm not talking about the lipstick and the blusher. I'm talking about the pretense that you can get through the next day. Don't do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. And Christian, neither can you. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. When we are fainting and when we are fading and when we are failing, it is faith. It is faith alone that will be the answer. Now, some of these other things, there may be a place for some of them in their legitimate sphere, but if they become the answer to your problems in the place of God, then you will find that they are feeble crutches. And when your weight is placed upon them, they will collapse under you and the splinters will go into your hands. There is fainting in this world. There is faith in the hearts of God's people. And there is favour. You see, this faith is not general. It's not vague and it's not empty. It's not the faith that things will work out better. It's not the faith that my dreams will suddenly become reality. It's not the faith that if I tell myself something often enough, things will get better. It's not the faith that if I speak words enough, they'll somehow the reality will come into existence. It's not the faith that I've got some kind of divine Santa Claus in heaven who's going to give me my health and my wealth and my prosperity. It's not the faith that I'm going to have everything just suddenly work out better for me and I'll get all the things I want and I'll have all the demands I make. The faith that keeps us from fainting is this. I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Brothers and sisters, that's what keeps our head above water. That's what enables us to press on. That's what brings us back from the brink. That's what stops the gloomy precipice from swallowing us up. I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The faith that stands against this hopelessness and this despair that is increasingly characteristic of our fallen world is definite, it's specific, it is substantial. It grasps the God of the Bible, the God of the covenant, the God of the promise, the God of salvation, the God of all grace. It is this God who is our helper, this God who is our strength, this God who is our redeemer. We believe what God has revealed concerning himself. We do not worship an unknown God like those Athenians did to whom Paul spoke. You know your God, brother. You know your God, sister. He is powerful. He is merciful. He is faithful. There is nothing that he cannot do. There is no depth to which you can sink where his heart will not still love you. There is no situation into which you can go where God says, I will no longer be your God. I can no longer be your God. He is all sufficient. Amen. Everything that you might require, he knows altogether and is well able to supply it as he sees fit. 
Here is the confidence then. Unless I had believed that I would see. Now, that is not just know about. It's not as in to, to see and to say, yes, I can tell you that that exists. Yes, sometimes we receive those, those newsletters, don't we? We hear stories of people being converted and saints being established, churches being planted, people are being saved and are being built up in the faith. We say, well, that's wonderful. That's the goodness of the Lord. And I can tell you that it exists. That's not what David is talking about. He's not saying I can just observe it at a distance, that I know that others are enjoying it, but there's no hope for me. To, to see the goodness of God, my friends, is to experience it for ourselves, to participate in the mercies of the Lord. I would see what? The goodness of the Lord. Now notice the name that David uses. This is the God of the covenant. I will be your God. You shall be my people. Be strong and of good courage. I will never leave you or forsake you. This, my friends, is the eternal I am. This is the unchanging, unchangeable God, infinite and eternal. All that he is, he is he always has been and he always will be. With him there is no variation, there is no shadow of turning. He dwells in that unchangeable glory. He is always shining. He is shining forth in goodness and in kindness. He has set his love upon his people and he has undertaken to love us to the very end. And this is the confidence of the man who is looking to this God, of the woman who looks to this God, that I will myself enjoy the covenant mercies of my God. That's what we set against the darkness. That's what we set against the helplessness and the hopelessness. That this God who has loved me in Christ Jesus will never cease to love me. Do you want to see the love of God? Then you look to a crucified Christ. Amen. Do you want to see the faithfulness of God? You look to a crucified Christ. Do you want to see the power of God? See the Son triumphing over sin and death and hell in the cross. Do you want to see the mercy of God? See his gaping wounds as the blood that cleanses flows. Do you want to see the goodness of God? Consider that that Christ has come into the world to save sinners. Do you want to see what God is like? Do you want to understand his goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness, his compassions, his strength, his wisdom? Then you look to Jesus Christ. Who are those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good? They're those who put their faith in him. We've been drawn to him. My friends, do you believe that you will see the goodness of the God and Father of your Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? You see, when you put it in those terms, when you understand that relationship, when you appreciate that this is God, your Redeemer, this is God mediated in the person of his Son, this is the God whose heart of love, whose hand of grace has been stretched out and opened toward you, can you believe that you will see the goodness of this God? My friend, how can you not believe? How, having given you his son, will he not with him also freely give you all things? So everything that God is and everything that God has done, all of these things are there, held before you in the scriptures. They are there to confirm they are there to underscore. They are there to drive home the fact that when God speaks, God carries out his promises. That when God loves, God never ceases to love. That when God grips, God never lets go. Unless I had believed this, 
Not just that things would work out better. Not that the sky fairy is going to sort me out. But unless I had believed that I myself would see the goodness, the covenant compassions of the God of my salvation in the land of the living. What does David mean? Well, he certainly means in this present world. He means the here and the now. Now, sometimes we talk theologically of the already and the not yet. And sometimes we make it seem as if there's nothing and eventually something. David says that's not true. Yes, in this present world there will be sufferings, there will be sorrows, there will be strifes, there will be griefs, there will be pains, there will be temptations, there will be afflictions, there will be persecutions. All God's people down through the ages have known these things. And yet there is an already. Brothers and sisters, we see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We see it in our bodies and we see it in our souls. I trust that you have all eaten today, or will. You sit here in relative comfort and peace. God has blessed you. If you're a Christian, God has saved you. You could be here starving and naked and close to death, and you would still be able to say, I know the goodness of my God in the land of the living. I'm in the kingdom of grace. I know the smile of the Almighty. He has kept me. He has sustained me. He has blessed me. I would dishonour God if I were to say there's nothing here for me. It's worthless. It's empty. It's pointless. Sometimes God's people get close to that. Asaf did. If I had spoken thus, I would have been untrue. I would have dishonoured my God. Brothers and sisters, we believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And when we are oppressed and when we are distressed and when we are assaulted and when we are afflicted, when we feel our creaturely feebleness, when we are attacked by the adversary, when we are assaulted by the world, when in seeking to serve God we feel our frailty and our emptiness... Here and now, God has undertaken to be good to his people. That's what holds up your soul. That's what lifts your eyes again. If you don't believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, what is the point? Why bother? Get to the end of the precipice? Really, you might as well jump off. Unless you know your God. Unless you understand his mercy, his power, his wisdom and his faithfulness. In this world, God will do you good, wisely and well. Now, you don't know when that will be. You don't know how that will be. This isn't you coming with a shopping list and saying, right, this is what I want and I need it by tomorrow morning. And we're so impatient now, aren't we? If the Amazon delivery doesn't arrive tomorrow, there's something wrong. If I've got to wait, it's very clever, isn't it? You order these things on the website, you can get it tomorrow, cost you 25 quid, or you can get it a week away. A week? Oh, maybe that 25 pounds all of a sudden seems a bit more worthwhile. I can get it tomorrow. God doesn't put a list of charges down. God says, I know the good that you need. And I know when you need it. And I know how you need it. And I will bestow it upon you in the land of the living. So, brothers and sisters, I can't tell you that if you're facing some particular distress or challenge, that by the end of the day, it will all be sorted out. I can't tell you that tomorrow will be better than today, it might be worse. I can't tell you that the next week will see things turn around for you. But I can tell you this, 
that God will do you his good in the land of the living. God knows what you need and God will bestow it at just the right time. Remember Psalm 46? When does the light shine? Just at the break of day. When would you like the light to shine? Maybe at midnight before it gets even darker. Maybe before the enemy come upon you. But no, God says, I will reveal my strength and my wisdom and my goodness in just such a way and at just such a time that your faith will be strengthened and my glory will be seen. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus went to Lazarus and Mary and Martha? Lord, if you'd come sooner, Lazarus would not have died. Doesn't he care? Doesn't he know? Can't he help? He knows. He cares. And he is able. But he will come and he will speak at the appointed moment so that God will be more glorified and you will be more satisfied. My friends, I can't tell you God's timetable, but I can remind you of God's nature. You will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You will see the goodness of the Lord among the saints, among those who live in Christ Jesus. He will preserve and protect his church. He will grant to us unity and peace and fellowship and love if we will trust in him and walk in his ways. He can preserve the happiness, the holiness, the security, the well-being of his church. He can make us to see good things, his good things, in the land of the living. Do we pray for conversion? Do we speak to friends, families, neighbours? Do we desire that more gifts will be given to this church? Do we want to see a greater zeal and a greater energy from heaven animating our hearts? Do we want to know what it is to have our souls lifted up in prayer? Do we want to know more sweet communion with our God in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit? Why do we preach another sermon? Why do we sing another hymn? Why do we come another Sunday? Why do we make another call? Why do we deliver another meal? Why do we sit down for another conversation? Why do we knock on another door? I mean, what's the point? Well, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I probably wouldn't have done any of those things. And then glory comes. And that's the land of the living too. That's the land of life. And if I have known God's mercies here, then I cannot lose them there. He will keep you, brother, sister. He will show you his goodness now. He will go on showing you his covenant goodness. And he will bring you at last into that heavenly Zion. He will bring you into his kingdom and his glory. You are now seated with him in the heavenlies. And one day seeing him as he is, you will be with him and like him. Unending peace and joy. Believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's a dangerous thing that David does. He leads us to the edge of the precipice. It's a terrifying place to look over into those dark depths, to gaze into the abyss and to think what my life would be like if there were no God and he were not my God and he were no good God. Some of you are living like that. And you need not. You can come this day to this God by Christ. You may trust in him now. And he will lead you back from the brink. It's a terrifying thought. It's a heartbreaking thought. 
when you knock on the doors, when you talk to people, when you, you stand in the stations in London, where you drive down the motorways in your car, when you look out of your windows. Without God and without hope in the world. David, therefore, leads us back to the bright uplands of faith. He says, look over. Imagine it. Feel it. Grieve over it. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would be falling down there. I would be over the lip. I would be beyond the brink. I would be tumbling down into darkness. But I do believe. I know my God, faithful, merciful and powerful. I know his goodness. I know his grace. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. My friend, you can say that if you know God in Christ. You can say that if you have trusted in him. You can say that if you have abandoned all your own efforts and endeavours to sort yourself out and to take away your own sins and to remove your own guilt and to address your own shame and to put yourself right. When trouble comes, when grief assaults, when friends despise and turn away, when my father and mother forsake me. David's taking you to the edge, isn't he? Your nearest and your dearest. I don't want anything to do with you. Then my Lord, this God, he will take care of me. Wherever I go, however far, whatever needs, however many distresses, whatever afflictions, whatever persecutions, whatever trials and tribulations, I know the God who loves me. David commends this faith. He's not theorizing. He's testifying. He said, this is my experience. I would have been overwhelmed. I would have fainted. I would have been crushed. I would have been destroyed. I would have sunk into misery and despair looking at what was around me and what was against me, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And commending this faith, he commands this faith. So you, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. My friends, our hope doesn't come from in here. It comes from the God of heaven. Our hope doesn't come from the strength of a man's hand. It comes from the mighty arm of our God. Our confidence lies not in our own heartiness, but in the heart of love that is revealed by God in Jesus Christ at Calvary. I know what some of you are facing, or maybe. Others of you, I haven't got a clue. But I know this that you will faint unless you believe that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. His goodness is seen, known, enjoyed, now and forever in Christ Jesus. Trust him and you must, now and eternally, see the goodness of a saving God. Amen.